Coming up on The World Today. Kabul airport blast. Taliban says several killed in explosions. Several Western countries wrap up Kabul evacuation operations. Plus, Venezuela searches for landslide survivors as more rains fall. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Lashubowale. We begin with our coverage of the situation in Afghanistan. There's been reports of twin bomb attacks at Kabul airport, with the Taliban reporting at least 13 deaths. Taliban officials say the number includes women and children, and that a number of Taliban guards had also been wounded. Explosions took place outside the Abbey Gate, uh, Abbey Gate where U.S. and British forces have been stationed and at a nearby hotel. The Pentagon says there's been a number of U.S. and civilian casualties in what it called a complex attack. It came after warnings that there could be militant attacks as nations evacuate people ahead of a 31st of August deadline. Well, hours ago, gunshots were also fired in the direction of an Italian military plane taken off from the Hamid Kazai International Airport in Kabul. Details are yet to emerge as to why the shots were fired or why, but there was no damage. In the meantime, like we mentioned, evacuations are continuing as some countries are already nearing the end. Uh, let's take a look at the efforts so far. Foreign forces and the last stages of evacuating citizens and eligible locals out of Afghanistan, with Canada announcing it has ended its operations. Belgium and Denmark have completed their last evacuation flights and Dutch flights are also coming to an end today. France says its last plane leaves tomorrow evening. <laughs> Earlier today, Germany's defense minister, Annegret Kram Karrenbauer, said a highly difficult and highly dangerous situation exists at the Kabul airport caused by Islamic State fighters hampering evacuation efforts there. She said the foreign ministry advised people overnight to no longer come to the airport on their own and that the country is likely to end evacuation flights by today. The U.S. says it will continue evacuation until the August 31st deadline. <laughs> British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says time is running out to get those left in Afghanistan out. We've got the overwhelming majority of those to whom we owe that debt out of Afghanistan as I stand and, and talk to you now. In the time we have left, which may be, uh, as I'm sure everybody can appreciate, uh, quite short, we'll do everything we can to get everybody else. Uh, but I, I want to stress that this is just the first phase. Apart from civilians, military personnel have begun evacuating as well. Turkish military has begun evacuating from the country after the Taliban had asked Ankara for technical help around Kabul airport, but insisted it would draw its military by the end of August. The plane carrying the first group of Turkish soldiers back home landed at Ankara's Esambolga airport today. Turkey was part of a NATO mission in Afghanistan and still has hundreds of troops at the airport. It has also been involved in evacuation efforts since the Taliban took control of the capital this month. Back in Afghanistan's capital city, some residents praised the Taliban takeover, saying life has been good since then. Well, still speaking of the evacuations at Kabul airport, Canada has joined several countries in wrapping up evacuation operations. Uh, but the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, says the country will continue its engagement in Afghanistan and vows his government would put pressure on the Taliban to ensure the safe passage of evacuees from Afghanistan to Canada, even after the August 31st deadline. Now that they're waiting, now that they've seen the last Canadian plane, is left. We have been... 
In the meantime, former Afghan ambassador to the UK, Ahmad Wali Masood, says the people of Afghanistan are distrustful, uh, distrustful of Western countries, especially the United States, who aimed to root out terrorism or left a chaotic situation after their 20-year presence in the country. The founder of the Masood Foundation and former ambassador says the United States signed a landmark peace agreement with the Taliban in Qatar's capital Doha last February, which included requirements for the Taliban to reduce violence and the withdrawal of foreign troops from the country. However, the deal failed to bring peace to the country. And now two members of the U.S. House of Representatives have traveled to Afghanistan, prompting a warning from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who Hi. said such trips could divert resources from the evacuation of Americans and at-risk Afghans. Representatives Seth Moulton, a Democrat, and Peter Major, a Republican, both of whom served in the Iraq War before running for Congress, said in a statement they went to Kabul to gather information as part of Congress oversight role. As their visit was made public, Pelosi sent a letter to House members that did not mention Moulton or Major, but cautioned that the Pentagon and State Department had asked lawmakers not to travel to Afghanistan Afghanistan during this time of danger. First, I can confirm the president does still plan to go and cancel. Oh, Channel TV correspondent Maria Bird joins us now for more on the situation. Uh, Maria, security warning from foreign forces uh, earlier warned of this ter uh, terror threat. Now there's been a twin explosion at Kabul airport. As the Biden administration responded to today's developments, what are you hearing? Yes, the Biden administration has responded. And Tanila, thank you for having me. Um, it is, I think, at this time, a bit of a chaotic uh, motion at the White House. There was several press briefings scheduled, the Pentagon, but they're just wrapping up a national security meeting uh, to discuss. As we know, there are American casualties that have occurred. Um, and I think this even more puts to presence. I think the president has known for quite some time now that there was a potential ISIS threat. Even last week, uh, there were warnings regarding the fact that we needed to be aware whether or not it was going to happen at the Kabul airport. I think that was uh, not known. But yesterday, as you said, this threat and this warning, um, and, and as you stated before, um, Nancy Pelosi has stated uh, that this is not the time for American lawmakers to be traveling to the country, even if they are looking for an extension uh, mm -hmm. to the August 31st deadline, which we know is not just President Biden's extension. This is also what has been stated by the Taliban. And you mentioned the lawmakers there. Before we get to the lawmakers, is this uh, latest development likely uh, to have any impact on the U.S. evacuation efforts? We know that about over a thousand Americans are still at Kabul um, waiting for evacuation. How, how is this likely to uh, impact the U.S. efforts ahead of the August 31st deadline? I think what we're going to expect to hear is that this is going to definitely expedite, expedite uh, the evacuation. I think at this time, uh, the president has no choice but to find a way to quickly remove the thousand um, Americans, as you stated, and those who are planning to be evacuated before the 31st. I think it's going to uh, be an effort that I think in the next couple of hours we will hear uh, that whether it's around the clock um, air flights coming out of Kabul, um, but I know they're going to definitely have to have some conversation with the Taliban and have to figure out a way uh, to um, for, to further support the U.S. in a way in which uh, there can be more security around the, the airport and obviously security for Americans and those Afghan allies um, that are too hopeful uh, to make it to the U.S. We also know that many U.S. allies who have been helping with the evacuation efforts are potentially going to end those efforts as a result of these two twin explosions. Okay, let, let's speak about the uh, lawmakers now who recently traveled to Kabul. What more do we know about their mission? 
Their mission is really surrounding what they've stated. Their mission is to try to extend that August 31st deadline. So it seems that they're going in and try to have conversations um, with the Afghan government, the Taliban at this time. But we've not um, surely uh, secured exactly their full mission, but they have stated that they're hopeful for an extension on President Biden's August 31st deadline. You know, now the lawmakers are in Kabul and President Biden said on Tuesday that the withdrawal date stands with, you know, other European countries now wrapping up evacuation efforts. How realistic is this deadline for the U.S.? I think with these explosions, there's going to really be no choice unless they receive some support um, from allies again, unless some of the allies reverse their, their support efforts, and also unless they have some conversations with the Taliban that will allow for peaceful exiting after the 31st. I think that at this point, President Biden is up against a wall. I don't know if he's going to have much wiggle room. Uh, Maria, just, you know, there's been a lot of criticism, you know, for the president uh, over this evacuation efforts. But what about, you know, the rest of the uh, administration, the Minister of Defence? You know, it's just speak to us uh, about the criticism that or the statements this is garnering uh, in the U.S., well, the U.S., as we know, many Americans uh, were critical initially just due to some of the human rights perspectives um, of the 20-year war in Afghanistan that the U.S. has been supporting and the, uh, the funds that have been placed on this. And, and so many of our troops' careers were spent um, in Afghanistan uh, for their entire uh, military career. And so they had a affection toward uh, the Afghan people, and they know so many of the Afghan people have been allies to the U.S. So there was great criticism from that perspective. But I think when President Biden has been coming out, um, as you said, Tuesday, he spoke on Sunday, he's been speaking over the uh, almost every other day for the last week in regards to this. And he has been very clear that there are several issues that the U.S. has to address. There's um, a global economic pandemic that's occurring uh, we're in the midst of, of reinventing our infrastructure here in the U.S. and the amount of funding that has been placed toward that, that at this time the U.S. does not have the ability to focus on a war that um, was always set to end at some point. And there was always a plan to remove the troops. And we had started beginning that process before this. And so uh, this was not something that was not planned. Now, the way the exit happened and how abrupt, I think that was unexpected. But I think many Americans begin to understand his political position and his position for what was best for the American people. Um, but this obviously will definitely uh, put another sort of wrinkle and definitely a, a very um, hard uh, task upon the president because the American people are obviously going to be very upset and are you know, uh, very upset to see that ISIS um, has been able to attack the airport and that they're now a greater threat to not only Afghanistan, but to America as well. All right then, Maria, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed. We'll have more on the situation in Afghanistan uh, during the course of the bulletin. In the meantime, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has left the uh, Vietnamese capital, Hanoi, ending her first official trip to Southeast Asia. In a news conference marking the end of the visit, she said the United States welcomes competition and does not seek conflict with Beijing, but will speak up on issues like maritime disputes in the South China Sea. China, Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines and Taiwan lay claim to parts of the disputed waters of the South China Sea, which is crossed by vital shipping lanes and contains gas fields and rich fishing grounds. In visits to Singapore and Vietnam, Harris charged China with bullying its Southeast Asian neighbors, triggering sharp rebukes from Beijing, which accused the U.S. of meddling in regional affairs and disrupting peace. The still to come on the program. Biker pulls off massive front flip hill clicker said to be a world's first. More in a moment. Stay with us. 
Thanks for staying with us. Israel's Prime Minister Naftali Bennett hopes to reset relations with the U.S. and agree how to stop Iran's nuclear program during his first meeting with President Joe Biden at the White House. The right-wing nationalist took office in June after forming an ideologically diverse governing coalition. He succeeded Benjamin Netanyahu, who was close to Donald Trump and clashed with Barack Obama's administration. Mr. Bennett said he was bringing a new spirit of cooperation from Israel. He also made clear that Iran would be top of his agenda, especially the leap achieved by its nuclear program over the past two or three years. The administration is committed to ensuring that and our rescue workers are searching for more than a dozen people who are missing after landslides tore through towns in Venezuela's western Mary district uh, state. With 10 more days of rain forecast, rescuers are racing to reach those feared buried before new mudslides are triggered. 20 people are confirmed to have died in emergency workers have still to reach some of the worst hit areas. President Nicolas Maduro said more than 8,000 homes had been destroyed. Well, let's head back to the latest developments now in Afghanistan, where the Taliban says at least 13 people have been killed in twin bomb attacks at Kabul airport. Uh, officials say the number includes women and children, and that a number of Taliban guards had also been wounded. Uh, security analyst Chidi Nwaunu uh, joins us now for more on this. Chidi you know, Western nations uh, had warned of a possible attack at the airport. Uh, what do you think of today's development? Well, there was almost um, a certain certainty that there was going to be some form of an attack. Uh, and this attack was, you know, uh, within the keeping of what, what we would have expected, you know, uh, a combined suicide bombing attack followed up by small arms. So it was inevitable. It took, a, it took a while, which, you know, maybe is a credit to both the Western forces and the Taliban in, in keeping off ISIS-K, but it's also at impetus uh, for wrapping up the evacuation. At this point, do you think the Taliban will hold up their side uh, of the agreement till the August the 31st deadline, uh, seeing what has happened today? Well, this gives them a very good reason to not um, keep their end of the bargain, but they're most likely going to try as best they can to ensure that the evacuation takes place. Because if, if there are Westerners, uh, you know, British, American, French passport holders left in Afghanistan, that gives the Western powers an excuse to come back in. So it's, it's in everybody's interest for, you know, this evacuation to take place successfully. Okay, most foreign forces are now wrapping up their, their evacuation, uh, but they warn that people will be left behind. That's the reality. Today, the Taliban announced a ban on music in Afghanistan. Is this a glimpse of, you know, the future of the, the people left in the country? So in answer to the first part of the question, you know, what, what you're seeing is, is expectation management. People are, uh, are getting the populations ready for the fact that, you know, there's a possibility that, uh, you know, Westerners or, or people who work for, you know, the Western Alliance will be left behind in Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, you might see hostages, you might hear, you know, things coming out, you know, that will be unpleasant. And the example you've given of the ban on music is is typical of what is to, to be expected. So, so far, the, the Taliban have played a very... Uh, savvy game in that they've, you know, said the things that everybody wants to hear because their objective is to get foreign forces out as quickly as possible. As long as we've got a foothold there, there's a possibility that we could come back. So once we're gone, then they can revert to type and carry on doing what they wanted to do from the beginning. 
All right, Chidi, uh, just before I let you go, with this um, explosion today, the Taliban is, has been in talks in forming its government, and well powers have you know, rejected uh, any government of the Taliban so far. But how successful do you think the Taliban can prove to the world uh, as a legitimate government? Well, uh, legitimacy, is, uh, legitimacy is either conferred by, you know, uh, by force or by simply being in place. And, you know, they are the government, whether we like it or not, even though there is a shadow government right now in the Panjshir Valley. They will be denied a lot of things simply to, in order to modify their behavior and to force them to behave themselves. So the example you've given of, you know, the ban on music, and then eventually there'll be a ban on women in the workplace. They'll use the, the, the exclusive security to ban women from being in the workplace. The, the world powers can put pressure on them by, you know, this uh, refusal to recognize uh, their government and refusal to uh, extend funding to them. And even ostensible, not, I wouldn't say allies, but powers that are not hostile to Afghanistan like China or, uh, sorry, to the Taliban like China or Russia have still not recognized the Taliban government. So it's, it's, a, it's a privilege that every power is going to retain in order to get the best possible deal they can out of the Taliban. Then, uh, Chidi Nwau, new security analyst, thank you so much uh, for your thoughts and analysis on the program. Well, let's take a look at the latest from around the world now in our COVID-19 global update. The global update continues in the United States, which administered more than 364.8 million COVID-19 vaccine doses as of Wednesday and distributed over 430 million more, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The CDC tally includes two dose vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech, as well as Johnson & Johnson's one-shot vaccine as of Wednesday. Health regulators could approve a third COVID-19 shot for adults beginning at least six months after full vaccination instead of the previously announced eight-month gap. The Japanese government has announced it will expand the COVID-19 state of emergency to Hokkaido, Miyagi, Gifu, Aichi, Mai, Shiga, Okayama and Hiroshima amid the country's latest resurgence of infections. Tokyo and 12 other prefectures have already been covered by the state of emergency. The measures will come into effect on Friday in the newly added eight prefectures until September 12th in all areas under the state of emergency. <laughs> South Korea has begun its coronavirus vaccine rollout for people between the ages of 18 and 49 as it aims to give at least one dose to 70% of the population and fully vaccinate 50% by September amid a surge in COVID-19 cases. The country reported 20 COVID-19 deaths for Wednesday, the highest daily counts this year, as the number of severe cases more than doubled since the current and worst infection began in July. Finally, Australia's new daily cases of COVID-19 topped 1,000 today for the first time since the global pandemic began, as two major hospitals in Sydney set up emergency outdoor tents to help deal with the rise in patients. Sydney, Australia's largest city and the epicentre of the current outbreak, is struggling to stamp out a surge of the fast-spreading Delta variant, with daily infections hitting record levels even after two months under lockdown.